I'll turn to our final session um, on the on work that's happening today in racial justice uh, through JTF and, and in the Jewish community. Um, I just wanted to share with you um, that a really wonderful and important event that we are having um, upcoming at JTF on May 12th, which is um, which is on on reparations. And for those who were in, sorry, I meant to send that to everyone. For those who were in um, Professor Grafman's session, um, he really laid a wonderful theoretical um, groundwork for a session that's going to be very, a, a panel discussion that's going to be very, um, very practical uh, in, in orientation and really kind of struggling through what, what would reparations actually um, look like? What have we learned specifically from reparations um, from the Holocaust that can be applied to reparations for not only for slavery, but for all of the uh, systemic injustice that's happened since then. So I hope you'll join us on May 12th for that discussion. Um, if you can uh, go to the website and see a really wonderful panel that we assembled. Um, okay, on that note, I'm, I'm really pleased to, um, to turn to our final speakers. Um, right. Are you ready for us? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find your bio. Okay, here, here, your bio. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just thrilled with this panel. Um, and, and um, here we go. We have Kendall Pinky, who is a Brooklyn-based theater maker, Jewish life consultant, and medical student at JTS. Kendall works and creates art at the intersection of race, Jewish identity, and sacred sex. And he is most recently been featured in the acclaimed new Israeli docu series, The New Jew. Um, uh, with comedian Guri Alfi, um, Saturday Night Theater, and the Unholier Than Male podcast. His broader collaborative work has been presented at venues such as 54 Below, Joe's Club, and many others. I'm going to leave off just in the interest of time. In addition to his creative work, he's a a fellow for the Jewish Arts and Culture Organization's Reboot. And, I think Laba, if that's what I'm pronouncing it correctly, and he serves on the spiritual direction team at Amud, the Jews of Color Torah Academy. He is a Western Davidson Fellow and 2017 recipient of New York Jewish Week 36 under 36. He is so talented. We are so lucky to have him uh, um, as a wonderful student at JTS, and I'm so, um, so lucky to have him in this program tonight. Um, and that will be in conversation with Rabbi Stephen Lesgay who is Associate Dean of the Rabbinical School at JTS. She has made her career in the Jewish social justice sector, having served in leadership positions at American Jewish World Service, Auburn Theological Seminary, Avodah, the Jewish Service Corps, and Join for Justice. However, she directs field education and entrepreneurial endeavors and is focused on raising the scope and profile of social justice work and community organizing skills in the role of the contemporary rabbi. She also serves as faculty for the Just City Leadership Institute, which is JTS's preeminent um, um, program for, uh, for high school students, focusing on leadership and social justice. Um, Rabbi Leske is a member of the Social Justice Commission of the Rabbinical Assembly, um, as well as the Student Placement Commission. So Rabbi Leske and Endel um, have just brought JTS uh, into the 21st century in terms of racial justice. And I know you're going to uh, be fascinated by what they have to say. And I, I turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks, Julia. Hi, everybody. I wish we could be in the same room so I could sort of feel the energy of all the learning that you've been doing. But I did get one text from somebody who said, I'm in Rabbi Tucker's class and it is amazing. So I'm hoping that you all had that experience. Um, so I'm Stephanie Reske. Kendall and I have been working particularly closely over the last year. Um, and so we're going to kind of have a conversation and share some of the things that we've been working on over this time, but really the emphasis and anyone who's been my student at JTS knows that really it's like, so what are you going to do? So our hope is that you had lots of opportunities to think about what you might like to be different in the world as a result of the sessions you were in tonight. And now is a chance to think about, but what are we going to do? Um, so you looked at racial justice and Jewish values tonight, reparations, reproductive justice, and Heschel's role as a key Jewish figure intertwining his justice and religious commitments. And we really believe that anybody 
can make a difference, no matter what job or lay leader role you have or lack of any of those things. By being a person who came here tonight, we think you have the capacity to make change and sometimes change is small and regular. So Kendall is the only black rabbinical student at JTS and also the first. We're committed to having him be the first of many. Some of us watched the president's address to Congress this week and saw two female leaders sitting on the dais as speaker and vice president. And I will tell the, you that for me, it mattered way more than I imagined it was gonna mean. And I just felt really emotional when I saw it. And so in some ways, this session and why we started, we're starting with identity and Kendall being here as a black rabbinical student is that seeing people who look similar to, similar to you at the front of the room is enormously important and a big piece of racial justice. So Kendall and I are, having a lot of our work being about trying to address the pipeline of Jewish life to help create more on ramp so Kendall is not an, alum, an anomaly. So Kendall, would you just share a couple of stories that would sort of demonstrate how we've been finding that this really works out in the world lately? Sure, um, it's really so wonderful to be with everyone this evening and I hope that you can hear me well. Um, so, right, I, I mean, it's a, it's weird being the first of anything. Um, that being said, ever since I was a relatively young kid, um, I happened to grow up inside of the Black church down in uh, South Dallas, Texas. Um, and so when I was at church, I was one of many who looked like me, sounded like me, acted like me. But often whenever I would go to school starting at a very young age, I would be the only Black kid or one of two or three. So I guess I would say that I, it's not so weird to be the only Black person. Um, I had to learn how to do that relatively young. I think one of the weird things has been realizing just how much it can mean and has meant to certain, um, to certain folks who see me. So to just give a couple of very small anecdotes, um, over this past year and the work that I've been doing, which really sits at the intersection of the arts, which is my great passion, which I've trained for most of my life, and identity, racial identity, Jewish identity, all the identities. Um, so I have been doing a lot of presentations um, in a lot of Jewish communities and saying yes to a lot of different projects. And over the past year, um, I've had two really special stories, one of which um, was from um, a mother, a Black woman, woman of color, um, who when I was speaking at another session with Rabbi Resquet, she pointed to the screen and told her young son, like, look, he's going to be a rabbi. Um, you know, her young Black son, like, look, he's going to be a rabbi, um, and he's going to be a conservative rabbi, to which her son was just absolutely elated and very excited to see someone who looked like him. Um, so maybe we expect that from the American side of things. But just to point to the fact that this actually goes beyond America. Um, so the one part of my bio that was recently, that was mentioned, um, is that there's a new uh, docu-series in Israel on American Jews, um, which is kind of unprecedented for Israel, where maybe American Jews are not the people who they necessarily care about so much, um, or to at least see them you know, in primetime TV. So there's an episode on Jews of color um, and what all does that mean? And I give a performance of a monologue that I wrote inside of the episode, as well as an interview. And there was an Ethiopian Israeli woman who I was recently on a panel with who runs an NGO or is involved in an NGO. She said that when she watched it with her son, um, who also happened to be like a, a young kid of like nine years old, um, when I started talking about being the only Black Jew in the room, he said, oh, I know what that feels like. And his mother was kind of shocked. Like, that was the first time that he had ever found language to start to describe some of his experience of being the only brown kid in his particular class in Israel. And she said it was the first time that they also had a chance to really have a conversation about it. And so when I heard that story as I was on this panel, needless to say, I was almost like in tears and had to quickly pull it together. But it just goes to show that, you know, I stepped into JTS. I'm, I was wanting to learn Torah. I was wanting to 
um, be part of this community and see if I could bring this arts thing into it as well, only to find out that there were far more people who were this doing and that it meant something more to them um, than I could have ever imagined. So it just really goes to show that representation can mean far more than we think it does. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about Hebrew. If you had asked me like a year ago if I would spend a lot of time talking about Hebrew education, I would not have said that that was going to be the thing. But it turned out through being in relationship with Kendall and other Jews of color who we've been working with on how to address the pipeline issue, it turns out Hebrew is <clears throat> a moment where people either have access to it or not. And if you don't have access to it, it's much harder to become a rabbi. It's much harder to become a lay leader, although I know many people do become lay leaders and sometimes they feel like, I wish I had better access to Hebrew. So we're raising it now because you all are members, leaders, clergy at shuls, all in, mainly in the DC area. And we wanted to invite you to think a little bit about who, when you teach Hebrew, when you offer adult education, um, who's going? Are there any Jews of color who are there? Um, how, how is it being taught? And is it being taught by people who have both pedagogic training as well as training around racial sensitivity? So that when someone is in their class feeling like already I might be an outsider, are they prepared to sort of offer the Hebrew pedagogy and also think about like, what are they bringing about learning Hebrew to this experience? And so this is really an invitation to think like, are there a lot of Jews of color in our Hebrew language program now for adult ed? Are there Jews of color a lot in our day school and our religious school? And if they're not in any of those places and Hebrew is such an essential part of sort of how conservative Jews do Jewish, then of course they're not gonna be at the center of organized Jewish life and leadership. And so this is an invitation to, to rethink that um, and pay attention to who's there. We are also starting something that uh, in partnership with USCJ, um, we are launching a Jews of color cohort for USY. And it's gonna be launching actually in the next month or two. Um, it's gonna be run by um, a man named Rafi Forbush who, worked, who grew up in St. Paul in the Jewish community. It feels a little bit like a tikkun for it to be coming out of the Twin Cities. And this is something that like, we're gonna be putting at a national call to have a, a Kadima group and a USY group. And the idea is that Jews of color would have an opportunity if they wanted to gather separately virtually and sort of talk about what's it like to be a Jew of color in USY, but to learn the skill, the leadership skills, the tefillah skills, like the things that happen in USY and then be able to come back into or simultaneously be operating in USY where someone doesn't have to feel like an outsider um, and there's some solidarity of just shared experience. And so um, one of the things that we know is gonna happen is that it's gonna sort of raise up areas where we need more staff training. Um, we need staff training around racial justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so really we're mentioning it here because there's not one place that you train staff from all over the country who are youth workers or clergy or lay leaders. It's gonna to have to happen in pockets. And so as people who chose to spend tonight talking about reparations and Jewish values and, and racial justice, it's an opportunity to think in your own community, who are the kids who might really gravitate towards this USY cohort who might find their place, even if they really don't come to USY other than this. And we are starting with Kadima. And on this call, tonight is our colleague and friend, Heather Miller. So Heather in lots of ways is why this cohort is starting. She's the president of her synagogue in Brooklyn, which is a conservative shul. And she came to a webinar that Kendall and I did in the beginning of last summer um, when we were starting to notice and talk about the ways in which COVID was disproportionately hitting communities of color. Um, and then after George Floyd was murdered and it felt like our shuls and our camps, we weren't, we weren't prepared to have the kinds of conversations we wanted to have around racial justice. And so we did some conversations where we invited camps and shuls to think about, you know, if someone came to your camp or shul and that was all they knew about the Jewish community, who would they think we were? And uh, is that who we want them people to think we are? And if we're not satisfied, then what are we gonna do to change it? And so Heather came to one of those webinars and 
she wrote a beautiful letter after saying, basically, that was a very nice webinar. And I looked at your website and I didn't see anyone who looks like me, I'm black. And also I can't really imagine sending my kids to USY because they go to day school and it's the most traumatizing place around race. And they have experienced a lot more racism in their short lives in day school than I ever have in my life. And that was heavy. And so, um, but, and to her credit after writing that beautiful letter, she has become a partner who we work with regularly. And she worked with Kendall and me with USCJ to put on a racial justice conference this fall. We had drop-in hours every week for every, I think it was every other week for three months on racial justice and people could come, just come with what's going on in your community and how to, so we don't all have to make the same mistakes all over the country at the same time, but we can make different ones and learn from each other. Um, so Heather is part of our team. We probably should have had her on the panel tonight, but anyway, she's here in sort of out in the ether with all of you, but is definitely a main person and reason on her words for why we're starting this cohort. Um, Kendall, you mentioned, theater was mentioned in your bio and you talked about it as your training, but in some ways, to my surprise anyway, it's become like a big piece of our racial justice connection and work. So will you talk a little bit about how you see it fitting together and what you're doing? Absolutely. Um, entering into JTS, if you had asked me that I would be able to come out with even more of a sense of an integrated, like rabbinic theatrical idea, I, I probably would have laughed. Um, I thought that was something I was gonna have to figure out on my own afterwards. So I've been really pleased to find out that there's been a lot of energy around building an arts and culture presence around this at JTS. So um, put simply, I want to see JTS be a hub of arts and culture it does meaningful work at the intersections of Jewish identity, religious identity, race, and civic engagement. Now, I imagine at least a few of you are thinking, but hold up, doesn't JTS already do that? And yes, you would be right to some extent, but a key difference is you might notice I put arts and culture at the very front of that. And there's a reason why I did that. It's because art allows us to access a different part of ourselves than just about anything else. I don't know about you all, but even for me, when it comes to matters of having a conversation around race, around reparations and things like that, my shoulders start to ride up, my arms start to cross, and I start to think, oh goodness, what's gonna happen? Uh, this is very uncomfortable, right? So it's because so much of our identities feel like they're on the lines, like we might say the wrong thing if we are having a discussion or if we're seeing a debate on these matters. When it comes to art though, and in my case, it's theater, it often allows us a kind of distance to gain a little bit of clarity on the matter and ironically um, or paradoxically also to see inside to the truth that is really at the core of what we're trying to address. I know I felt that in my experience with art and that's why I think art is so powerful and why we should really utilize it in a way that respects the integrity of the art and doesn't only make it ancillary to doing Jewish education or to you know, teaching Torah. So, I believe that the human experience in and of itself can be Torah. So to say a couple of words about some of the projects that we are hopefully getting going, some things we're actually kicking around and some things that will actually happen. Um, first things first, I wanna talk about a, an organization that I kind of co-started with a bunch of um, collaborators and troublemakers from around the US and in Canada. So a group of Jewish artists of color um, decided to come together to put together um, a convening of Jewish artists of color um, called PRISM. We had a convening where over 115 people uh, registered and about approximately half of the people showed up. And it was just a beautiful time to be together, to form community and also to create. And what's kind of started to develop from there was this notion of doing a residency for artists who are Jews of color um, indigenous and Sephardi and Mizrahi artists. And thankfully there's a lot of energy amongst said artists in New York to do that. Um, and there's a lot of energy and conversations at JTS. So that's one example of something that's starting up. Now, talking about something that actually looks like it's on its way towards happening. Um, through just doing a lot of community building work, which I learned from Rabbi Reske, who's a wonderful community organizer, 
I started to reach out to more Jews of color around the US and Canada. Um, I got connected with one brilliant actor named uh, Bill Demerit, and he was recently in a piece that's being broadcast online uh, called The Catastrophist, and actually features the story of renowned um, virologist Nathan Wolf, um, who happens to be Jewish, and it's about his experience of falling in love with science, his experience of losing his father, and what it was like to be a virologist as the pandemic was happening. Bill happens to be a Jew of color. Um, so through our conversations, we just realized that we had a really good vibe building up. And so I introduced him to Rabbi Reske. And then Rabbi Reske also saw the catastrophist and we were blown away um, together. And we said, we need to find some way to do something together. So we text Bill, Bill texts the playwright, Lauren Gunderson, who happens to be the most produced playwright in the US. And we have figured out, okay, JTS, we wanna do something with this playwright, this acclaimed playwright, this actor, um, and with uh, a couple of other theater companies that are also involved in this production. So this is one way that we can also expand the reach of the movement, honestly, beyond the movement um, by really partnering with some groups that maybe we didn't think about before. Um, so the final thing that I'll say about it is that I think that arts really is a way to build robust relationships with diverse communities. And I think that if we get an artist residency going in some of the ways that we've been talking about internally at JTS, one of the things that's going to allow us to do in a really profound way is actually start building more on the ground day-to-day -day relationships with our surrounding communities in Harlem. Um, there are, for example, we our campus is right next to a housing project. And sure, there's some relationship there, but what would it actually be to start a theater program that has Jews of color, indigenous Sephardi Mizrahi artists as um, teaching artists who are actually building relationships with kids who live in those projects or in the various schools around the area. In essence, the sky is the limit. And I think that we would be crazy not to use the arts in order to do it. And again, I'm an artist, so I'm biased. So. Uh, <laughs> All right, I've said enough on it. Thank you, Kendall. So basically we're hoping that among the many things our theater is gonna do, one thing that it will do is incubate Jews of color led theater, which to the best of our knowledge, we don't think anybody else is doing. And through art, we'll start to change um, sort of minds. Um, so seeing Bill, who's a Jew of color, tell this whole story where he is the Jewish person and it's not about race at all. It just is about race because it's the subtext of how he does the play. So that is going to be virtual and you can all watch it. And then we'll have a talk back with Kendall and Bill and Lauren and Nathan. <laughs> um, OK, and that's coming soon, like in July, maybe. Um, so Kendall, one of the messages that I have very much internalized through our work together is that none of us talks for everybody who might look like us. We're just one Jewish person, one Black person, one Black Jewish person. And like part of this is you have to be in relationship with a lot of people who are different from you in order to have a sense of what other people are thinking. Um, but one of the sessions tonight was about Heschel and, and the way that Heschel showed up as a Jewish social justice, civil rights leader and brought all of it together. And the Jewish community loves to sort of talk about Heschel and King as like, this is how we did civil rights. And so, it feels important in this event to sort of talk about when I talk with you, you always say, but like growing up, Rabbi Heschel wasn't, he was not a main player in what I knew about civil rights. And what you always say to me is like, but what are, where have we been since then? And what are we doing now? And so it felt like a good moment. Like, first of all, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what it means for you when the Jewish community raises up like, well, Heschel and King, and we've We've always been doing this. How does it make you feel? What do you feel like it's important for people to hear about that, particularly from your context? Sure. Um, it feels okay, but it feels like it's overused, honestly. Um, so Heschel and King actually were friends. Yes, we should not downplay that. They really did have a friendship and um, an abiding relationship as friends. So starting there. But Oftentimes the way in which it is used 
where uh, I'll step into a Jewish space. Um, and oftentimes it'll be around, especially if I'm invited around MLK Day or something like that, I'll hear someone up on the Bema proclaiming or someone coming directly to me and almost even immediately after asking me my name, say, well, you know that Heschel and Kings and that they used to work together on civil rights, you know, we, we used to be so connected, what happened? Um, and I think that one of the reasons in which it's used so much is actually because it makes Jewish communities feel good and it's a sign of virtue. But someone, as someone who grew up in black, a black megachurch community um, that actually, it's a missionary Baptist, which is partly aligned with the legacy of Dr. King. Um, so I grew up in a church that had thousands of members and Heschel never came up. It didn't carry much weight then. And I generally think it doesn't carry a ton of weight in black communities today, at least that I've been a part of. So I think that we have to really think about what are we trying to do when we're mentioning Heschel and King because saying that Heschel marched with King at Selma, like my family members will be like, so you mean he was one of the 25,000 people who marched with Dr. King at Selma? It's like, folks don't know exactly where to put that. So that question of where have you been since Selma is really important. And I actually wrote a very short article about that. That's um, with the Wexner Foundation to which a lot of people, black Jews and black non-Jews who happen to have seen it emailed me and were like, Oh my goodness, yes, this sounds very real. Where have you been since Selma? Stop telling me about Heschel um, and expecting that to necessarily land in a certain way. So but beneath this, I think is the more important point that thinking that using a reference to Heschel and King is going to start a conversation, it doesn't necessarily do that. What we really want to do is build relationships. And to build relationships, you have to have consistent contact. And it has to go beyond one day of the year. It can't just be an interface Shabbat. It can't just be attending a single Sunday church service every couple of years. Rather, it has to be on the ground relationships. So huh, I've heard one other thing that I just briefly want to mention is I've heard a number of white Jewish communities or leaders say, well, we've invited you know, black church leaders to come to this or to come to that and we invite and then we don't hear back. Well, telling you from my experience, having been on the other side of that and actually talked to people about it, if black communities don't know you, it makes sense that they might be skeptical and not respond to your invitations. It's only once someone follows up and Rabbi Reske can give a lot of examples of the work that she did this past summer where she sent off some emails to get some conversations going. People did not respond, but she kept going back and kept the relationship building. It makes a lot of difference. So the last thing I'll also say is this work of building relationships, it cannot only sit on the shoulders of clergy. Your clergy, who are probably some of whom are probably here, are doing so much good work. There's only so much that they can do. It's really the responsibility of members, lay leaders, to also be doing this work. So I think that that's really the essence of it. Relationships, everyone getting involved in building those kinds of relationships. Thanks, Kendall. So we're going to turn to things that, that we think that you could do with us, um, which we're going to, I'm going to say verbally, and then we're going to also follow up and send you something that tells you how to do them with us if you want. But um, what Kendall was just saying about relationships, when we met Rafi Forbush, who is going to lead the US Jews of Color cohort, he said to us, you know, after George Floyd, Floyd died, it felt like, you know, the Jewish community was on the news talking about how we have to be doing racial justice work, but nobody called me. And nobody, like we, you had people sitting Shiva in your communities and were you calling them? And so it's interesting, the Jewish community actually does know how to do Shiva and we do know how to hold people in grief. And it was a chance to think about how do we take skills that we already have and might've thought were like for a different part of our lives and apply them to the racial justice work there that we're doing. And I will say that having heard Rafi say that, I have experimented um, over the last few months with 
drawing closer to and checking in with by phone and text with people who I already have relationships with. But when the Chauvin uh, verdict came down, it felt like that was a moment to, to be in touch, not just watch it on the news and think about it, but also to say, I'm thinking about you as we're sitting here waiting together, me in New York and you in Minneapolis. Or So, um, so here are things that we hope you might wanna do some of them. We hope you will wanna recruit for the Jews of Color cohort for USY. And we will tell you how to do that. Um, and look for um, places to do staff training that will need to accompany it. Um, we hope you'll look at your Hebrew programs and think who's coming here and who's not and how could we go find them and find out why not. Um, on June 17th in the evening, um, it's a Thursday, it's right before Juneteenth, which is um, a, a, a holiday like for the end of slavery, like the very end of slavery in this country, um, which many people found out about last year, <laughs> but has actually been uh, a holiday for a very long time. We are having um, a communal opportunity to be together and market and prepare. Um, it's being spearheaded by um, a shul in Caldwell, New Jersey. Um, those, some of those people are taking a community organizing class that I'm teaching right now and for only the conservative movement, clergy and lay leaders, and we're gonna launch another session in the summer. So you could be in that one, but we're, one of the projects they're doing is having this Juneteenth celebration and we're gonna invite everybody here. Uh, and we hope that some of you will choose to join us. Um, think about signing up for the organizing class this summer. Um, you can join us for the Catastrophist, which is the, the one person show that Kendall and I were talking about. And really like when you see something happening that you think that's not sitting right with you around racial justice, like write a letter, speak up, like don't just let it happen. And because those little things by everybody contributing make a difference. And when something bad does happen in your community, don't sweep it under the rug, like shine some light on it and talk about it because um, it's definitely probably not a one-time situation. And it gives us a chance to have case studies and to sort of, look at things that didn't go as well as we wished and things won't go well, not everything's gonna be perfect, but you keep showing up and you figure out and dissect like what went wrong and then how can we apologize and correct? Um, but it will surely be messy. Um, and finally, you can just reach out to me and I'm happy to do a consultation with your community about just like how could we be helpful or using organizing skills? What could you be different, doing differently to take some small steps? Um, so that's it, we're really happy to have been here with you tonight. We hope that this is just the beginning of our connection to you. Um, and thank you. This was really important time to spend together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Rabbi Riske and future Rabbi Pinckney um, for, for bringing it all together tonight um, from, from the learning into, um, into action as you, um, as you just did in such an inspiring way. And I just want to lift up um, what Kendall said about, or what, what uh, both of you talked about um, with theater, which I also, you know, never, never associated particularly with racial justice, but we had a conference a couple of years ago um, for rabbis and we brought Kendall as, a, as an expert uh, presenter who led us through this theater workshop um, on identity that that was kind of mind blowing. Um, each of us discovered so much about ourselves, and it and it brought everything into focus. Um, the idea of theater as um, as a tool for um, for for opening up issues and making connections. So I I really echo your um, your hopes and your cover note that JTS will become a center for that kind of work. Um, and we're just, we're so proud of both of you and, and lucky to have both of you um, as leaders in the Jewish community, you know, working out of the hub of JTS. So thank you to you. Thank you so much to the faculty uh, for really rich and challenging um, and valuable sessions. And thank you to everyone for coming. We hope it was a really worthwhile evening. Um, we will uh, follow up with you as promised um, on all the issues that were raised tonight. And we look forward to learning with you again very soon. Thanks again to everyone for coming. And uh, again, we hope to see you on May 12th in particular, um, just uh, coming up very soon for the discussion on reparations. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>